Let's talk about patronage for a couple minutes. In our modern society, we tend to find our social identity in horizontal relationships. Meaning, um, if you are a member of the poor class, you look left and look right and identify and find your place socially within the horizontal grouping of poor. Same with middle class or any other class. If you are a middle class person, you generally look left and look right and identify yourself and your place socially within the middle class rank in society, if you will. We are talking about patronage. And in the patronage system, social identities are generally constructed vertically, not horizontally. So the lowest single unit within society was the family structure, the household. And if you were the head of the household, either as a man or as a single woman, if you were the head of that household, all of the dependents in your household owed you reverence and loyalty. In return, you, as the head of the household, were expected to love and provide for all of your dependents. This same structure was then scaled across the entire system, all the way up to Caesar himself at the top. Caesar was known as the father of Rome. And so all in Rome owed, them, owed him their fidelity and their praise. And he, in return, was supposed to take care of them and support them. So from the family structure, um, we could go up to like a city structure. So cities would have patrons. Maybe some cities would have several patrons. They would support their patrons in their um, political aspirations, in their business dealings. In some cases, uh, clients would follow around behind their patrons, just cheer them on, just talk about great, hey, everybody, come see how great this guy is. Come take a look, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, he's amazing. Check out all the things he's going to do. He's great. And then when they would be making public declarations, if your, if your client and your patron was out speaking in public, the expectation is when they were done, you would clap. You didn't. Whether you supported their actual stance or not was very unimportant because you were their client and they are your patron. Your role, your duty in society is to support them. So then in return, let's say your city had a patron. If you are the patron of a city, it's your job to take on building projects and to support that city. Let's say they had a natural disaster, um, like an earthquake, all the way up and down the system, right? If there's an earthquake somewhere in Rome, it is the job of Caesar to make sure that resources get sent to where they are needed because he's the father of Rome. He is the highest level of patron and all beneath are his client. And all the way down, if you're the patron of one of the cities that was destroyed, you would use your personal wealth to rebuild that city. And in return, your honor, your glory, your dignitas would increase. And so as the city that you are the patron of would flourish and grow, they might put up a statue of you and your dignitas would grow. And then you would pay for a beautiful library to be put into that town. And then your dignitas would grow. And then more would desire to become your clients. And the more clients you have, the more your dignitas would increase. And the system of give and take in society where you are trying to get as much social capital as you possibly can Let's take a look at how this plays out. So if Tony is a poor person and he is a client of the patron, Miguel, then Tony would relate himself socially, would find his identity more as a client of Miguel's than as a friend of the poor person or as someone on a peer relationship with another poor person next to him. So in this case, because Tony and Tanya and Jim all are clients of the patron, Miguel, Jim, Tanya, and Tony, although they are in different horizontal classes in society, would actually find their identification as the same because they are all clients of Miguel, and that is where they would find their social identity. As you start to draw the connections between the various clients and patrons, you begin to see that it becomes the sort of messy web very quickly because these aren't one-to-one. -one. It's not that Tony is a client to the patron Miguel, and that is his sole connection. Tony very likely is a client of Miguel, a client of Bryce here, um, a client maybe of Tanya right here also, and so multiple clients can serve a single patron. Clients can serve multiple patrons. So why would someone choose to become a client of a patron? The simple answer is access to resources. These resources could be money, could be land, but they could also be social resources, access to people, and access to a higher level of prestige within the community. Let's say Tony down here makes shoes for a living, and he's been importing his leather from someplace out of town, and the prices just keep going up, and it's getting ridiculous, and he's gonna go out of business and be without a job if he doesn't get some leather at a better price. So because Tony is a client of Miguel's, he's gonna go to Miguel and say, Miguel, I know that you have a relationship with Max. I know you are one of Max's clients. And we all know that Max has a monopoly on leather. And so what I'm hoping you'll do is that you'll go talk to Max and that he will agree to then sell me leather at a more reasonable price so that I can continue to make the shoes. And Max, being a benevolent patron that we all know that he is, will say, of course, Miguel, of course, I will help your client, Tony, to get access to less expensive leather. And Miguel has now um, strengthened his relationship with Max. And Max has strengthened his relationship with Miguel. And Miguel has strengthened his relationship with Tony. And so Tony is going to be, want to sing the praises of Miguel all the more. Oh, my business was going out. And then he came in and he saved me. Oh, this Miguel, he's incredible. And then Miguel is, of course, whenever Max is around, he's going to be like, oh, everybody, you need to know this guy, Max. He's absolutely amazing. His, his generosity knows no bounds. Did you buy any of those great shoes from Tony? Yeah, let me tell you, that is only made possible because my man Max and his generosity. And what was it that held this complex web of interconnections? What held it together? Now, if you were a former slave, if you were a freed slave, there were legal requirements for you to be a client of your former slave master. That was a legally defined relationship. But for all others, 
It was primarily a social honor code that held the entire thing together, especially as time went on. In the earliest versions of the patronage system, it was more about the way a patron would exercise authority or held authority over their clients. But as the system developed, it developed into a system that was more about mutual support and honor than it was hierarchy and authority. An easy to miss aspect of the system is that it's primarily generational, meaning that if Tony was a client of the patron Miguel, by default, Tony's children would become clients of Miguel. And this can go on for generations and generations. Miguel's heir would be the patron to Tony's heirs on and on and on, as long as the system could be maintained. And so you can see that very quickly, within a few generations, Miguel's family has suddenly gathered an army of clients. And if, on top of that, right, it's not just that it was Tony as Miguel's client, but Miguel had all of these other clients. And then on and on through the generation, these webs grow more interconnected and wider and deeper to where power becomes centralized in just a few families. So this vertical alignment of patronage with Caesar on top has a very obvious conflict with Christianity. Christianity had its own vertical hierarchy, its own vertical structure, with God the Father on top, who sustains and loves and cares for all of his children. We owe God our fidelity and praise. You see, both systems required exclusive devotion. The parallels in these two systems were incredibly obvious to the early Christians. And they were so obvious that the book of Revelation actually references Rome's hierarchy as a false demonic version of the relationship between God and his church. You can see then that an entire society, right, Rome being built on this hierarchy, could not allow for a parallel hierarchy that, it, that Christianity represented.